In this session, I want to get you to think a little bit about what kinds of questions we can use. And in particular, I want to um, get, you, get you to think about whether your questions and the way you react to the students' answers is being done in an interpretive or an evaluative way. And I'll say a bit more about what I mean by that in a bit. But the example I want to get you to think about immediately is this one. Now, these, these are two questions uh, from the third international mathematics and science study, TIMS. And these happen to be the data on Israeli students. So question one, which fraction is the smallest? Success rate, 88%. Question two, which fraction is the largest? Success rate, only 46%. So what I'd like you to do now is just to uh, talk to a neighbor uh, or, or the rest of your group and just see, can you work out why it is that the second question was so much more difficult than the first? Why is the success rate for the second question so much lower than the first? And I'll give you a few minutes to do this. Okay, so um, typical responses to that question are that the first uh, question involves fractions that are familiar to students. They can visualize them. Uh, other responses are that the, uh, the fractions in the second item are more complex. Uh, the lowest common multiple isn't given to you in the second question, so you have to calculate it, whereas the, the lowest common multiple is actually one of the denominators in the first question. And all these responses are kind of true, but none of them is entirely convincing. And one of the things the researchers decided to do was to ask some students. And what they found is something quite interesting. They found that the students often had this naive belief about fractions that the smallest denominator makes the biggest fraction and the biggest denominator makes the smallest fraction. So if you look at slide 14, you will see that the strategy would they would actually attempt the first question with the idea, okay, so I want the smallest fraction, so I have to look for the largest denominator, so I find 6 and I choose A, and that's correct. And in the second question, I'm looking for the largest fraction, so I obviously must look for the smallest denominator. I find 4, choose B, and that's incorrect. And I think what's interesting about this is that the reason I think that I'm right in claiming that the reason that students were getting A right was often for the wrong reason is this. 46% of students answered B, the second question correctly, but 39% chose B. So that means that three quarters of the kids who got the second question wrong got the same wrong answer. There was a systematic error at work here. And that's what we find uh, in, in all kinds of places, uh, that children's errors are systematic. And this is hugely significant. In the first part of the 20th century, the dominant philosophy of psychology was associationism. The idea was that learning was making associations. So when children learn things, they made links between stimuli and responses. And so if children didn't learn something, it meant that they hadn't made enough links between the stimuli and the responses, and so teachers needed to reinforce them. And so drill and practice was a response to this view of psychology. But as we looked more carefully at students' learning, particularly in mathematics and science, we found students saying things that were clearly not the result of misremembering. If you ask children between the ages of four and seven what causes the wind, a very common answer is trees. Now, that's not the result of misremembering, nor is it the result of really poor quality science teaching by primary school teachers. It is children making up ideas to describe what they see around them. The idea is that learning is constructive. So there are some aspects of human learning, like multiplication facts and number bonds, that are well described by the old associationist view of learning. And there, practice is just what's needed. But when students are in more complex areas, you will find that children's errors are not random, they're actually systematic as a result of thinking about hard about what they're doing. And that's what's going on here. These errors are not random, and here's why I think this is the explanation. If you take 46% and add it to 39%, you get something very close to 88%, which is quite strong evidence that a lot of the children who got the first question right got it right for the wrong reason. And that's what we need to do to make our questioning really good, is to make sure that kids can't get the question right 
for the wrong reason. So we have to use an interpretive lens rather than an evaluative lens. It's not just about whether they got the answer right, is it's what that means. Because if we use questions that are not very well designed, and we ask the class a question and everybody gets the answer right, we will conclude that their learning is proceeding as, as it should be. But if the questions are of low quality, then it could be that the students are thinking something completely different about this particular topic than what we had intended. So when we switch from using an evaluative lens to an interpretive lens, we don't just say, great, they got the right answer. We say, yes, but what does that mean? Uh, incidentally, you can tell the teachers who have an evaluative rather than an interpretive approach to their teaching, because when kids get something wrong, they say things like, almost, nearly, close. But the teacher with an interpretive frame says, when the kid says something wrong, why do you think that? Or tell me more about why you think that's the right answer. So the idea is, we shouldn't just take answers at face value, we should actually say, what do we know when we know that kid's answer? And to do that well, we have to think of really good questions. And in particular, as I mentioned, we need to ask what I would call all student response questions every so often. So if you look at slide 15, um, here's what we've learned about what makes really good hinge questions. The idea is, and the name comes from the idea, that rather than designing lessons as straight lines, like an airport runway, where you start at one end and get as quickly as you can to the other, the idea is that we design our lessons with a hinge in it. So after about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you stop and you check to find out where the students are with you. So the idea is the lesson articulates around this point, that if the students are with you, you go on, if they're not with you, you go back, or something else. But the important point is that there's a moment that you check systematically and you make this part of your lesson planning. So what we've learned about hinge point questions from working with teachers is it should form about midway in the lesson, 20 to 30 minutes in. We think it takes too much time if the students take more than two minutes to respond. It's not meant to slow down the lesson. It's just meant to be a quick check on students' understanding. And here's the important point. You as the teacher must be able to collect and interpret the responses from every single student in 30 seconds. So uh, you can use dry erase boards, you can use ABCD cards, you can use finger voting, A, B, C, D, E. It's very quick to do, but the important thing is you must be able to make a quick decision on the fly do I need to go on or do I need to go back? And now I'd like to spend some time going through some examples of what I would regard as good hinge point questions in various different school subjects. I'm not saying that these are perfect. Uh, in fact, uh, all these can be improved. In fact, uh, teachers are always refining their questions and improving them. But I think they'll give you a starting point for thinking about your own practice. In mathematics, slide 16. In which of these right angle triangles is A squared plus B squared equal to C squared? Um, now, you may not care, but if I'm your maths teacher, I care. And the sneaky thing about this question is there are two correct answers, B and D. So uh, if I've been teaching this and every kid holds up B and D, congratulations, they get it, move on. The trouble with too many maths teachers is they can't take yes for an answer. They carry on teaching something after the students have already understood it. So of course, checking on student understanding will sometimes slow you down because you find out they didn't get something you thought they did. But sometimes it'll speed you up because you find out they already knew something you were about to teach them. And what I find interesting about this question is you could not use this question with an electronic voting system because there are two correct answers. Electronic voting systems can only be used with a single correct response. So it's a very quick way of finding out where the kids are. And what's interesting is because there's six different choices the kids could make, and they don't know how many are correct. Their chances of getting the right combination by guesswork is just one in 64. So if those kids are showing you B and D, they get it, move on. Science. Uh, the ball sitting on the table is not moving, and it's not moving because A, no forces are pushing or pulling on the ball. That's the standard misconception in this area. The idea is that if there's no movement, there's no force. And of course, what the science teacher trying to get over is if there's no movement, there's either no force or more likely, you have forces in equilibrium. B, gravity is pulling down, but the table is in the way. Now, that's pretty attractive, isn't it? Because if you ask kids separately, is gravity pulling down? Yes. Is the table in the way? Yes. So B looks pretty good. C looks much less likely, doesn't it? The table pushes up with the same force that gravity pulls the ball down. 
And of course, that is the question, that is the response the, the science teacher is looking for. And it's not very intuitive. You know, kids who don't really understand this are far more likely to choose B or, in fact, D. Gravity is holding it onto the table. E is unusual. E is um, for students who think that inertia is a force rather than a property of matter. But this question functions very well in classrooms. This is from Mark Wilson's team at the University of California, Berkeley. It works well because B and D are so attractive and so obvious that unless you really understand the physics behind this, you won't see why C is a better response. English. I mentioned earlier the, um, the question of, of uh, it's on its way. And here's a different way, a format for doing that. So here we have four different varieties. We have uh, the, the four options with the four possible ways of punctuating it's on its way. And you ask students which is correct. And students can just use finger voting. One for A, two for B, three for C, four for D. And you can very quickly check that the whole class understands this. You can take this further then uh, with a deeper questioning. Let's say I've been teaching a class about adverbs. And um, so I just want to check that they're still with me. So I give them this question. So uh, let's hope they can all get question one correct, because if they can't, then obviously um, the teaching hasn't been very successful. What I'd like you to do now is just spend 30 seconds talking to a neighbor. Why are questions two and three sneaky? Why are questions two and three sneaky? Okay, so um, what you'll have probably gathered is that uh, question two is sneaky because it, it, it says Jane usually crossed the street in a leisurely fashion. And of course it's sneaky because leisurely in that sentence is actually an adjective because it qualifies the word fashion, not an adverb. So that is designed to catch out all the kids who think that all L-Y words are adverbs. And the complementary uh, question is question three. Fred ran the race well, but unsuccessfully. And of course, that's sneaky because here you've got a word, well, which is an adverb, but not an L-Y word. So question two catches out the kids who think that all L-Y words are adverbs, and question three catches out the kids who think that all adverbs are L-Y words. But if your kids are answering all those three questions correctly, they get adverbs. Move on. A more complicated example uh, from high school uh, English Within the genre of persuasive writing, um, now different countries have different amounts of emphasis on this, um, but the important thing is in, in the genre of persuasive writing, the idea is you're trying to persuade somebody else of your point of view. And so while there are many statements of opinion here, and some things that we quite good thesis statements for a piece of factual writing, I think most English teachers would agree that D, the amount of violence on TV, should be reduced is the best thesis statement within the genre of persuasive writing. What drives English teachers crazy, of course, is B, uh, the essay I'm going to write about is about violence on TV. Students who think that uh, a, a thesis statement is an introductory statement will choose that one. But I think most English teachers would agree that if students can pick out D as being the best thesis statement out of all those, then they really understand the idea of a thesis statement in persuasive writing. In history, uh, why are historians concerned with bias when analyzing historical sources? Again, some very plausible looking answers here. People can never be trusted to tell the truth. People deliberately leave out important details. I like, I like C very, very much actually. People are only able to provide meaningful information if they experience an event firsthand. That teacher has been spending too much time on emphasizing the, the, the importance of primary sources. So now the kids think that if they were there, you know, you, people who are there know everything about the event, and people who weren't there know nothing about it. And I think most historians would agree that D is the best answer. So if students can identify D as the best response from that list, it's a pretty good indication that they get it, that they should move on. And modern languages, um, a group of teachers in, in Chico, in, in California, um, came up with this question. Uh, that they had a real problem with kids understanding um, uh, pronouns in Spanish. And uh, you know, there are two difficulties in, with, with, that English t speakers have with pronouns in Spanish. The first is, which pronoun do you choose? And the other is, where does it go? And this question is sneaky, because in some of these, you've got the right pronoun in the wrong place. In others, you've got the wrong pronoun in the right place. In one of these, you've got the wrong pronoun in the wrong place. And in just one of these options, C, 
you have the right pronoun in the right place. So if students get this question wrong, you know more than just they got it wrong. You know why they got it wrong. You know what difficulty they're having. And that's the shift from an evaluative lens to an interpretive one. In other words, don't just be concerned about our kids getting it right or not. Frame your questions in a way that gives you insight into their responses so that you know more than just they didn't get it and I better do it again but, but better, but that the answers that the kids give you give you some insight into their own learning and what to do next. I just want to highlight and finish off this, this topic of um, high quality questioning by giving you a question from uh, an international survey as it happens. And this question is a very bad question. And there it is uh, for you on slide 23. Uh, it's a bad question. And I'd like you to spend a minute talking to a neighbor about why it's a bad question. So just take two or three minutes. Why is that question such a poor question? Okay, well I'm sure you actually managed to see the typical answers there. Um, many people say you're not told whether it's AM or PM. You have to make assumptions about the, um, the length of the flight. Uh, you have to make assumptions that the plane didn't stop on the second flight. A huge number of assumptions you, that you need to make and these are all valid concerns. What's interesting is when you give this item to kids, none of those things matter because when kids see test like, items like this, they know they're not in the real world at all. They're in a place called Mathland where the rules of logic do not apply. What's in, the rules of Mathland mean that every time you're given a piece of information, you have to use it exactly once. And all the information you need is always in the question. And so students just take this question and they just calculate very quickly. 9.20 to 10.55, that's 1 hour 35 minutes. Add that to 2.15, I get 3.50. What's wrong with this question is that students who think there's 60 minutes in an hour and students who think there's 100 minutes in an hour will give you the same answer. In other words, this question is useless at telling you whether kids can do time calculations. And all you need to do to make it a better question, not a great question, but a better question, is, as version 2 shows on slide 23, just make the flight slightly longer. So the important thing is then make sure the kids' calculations has to take them over the top of the clock. So now the flight is 50 minutes longer, so some kids will write down a 405 as the answer, and some students will write down 365. Here's the crucial point to wrap this up. Good questions either cause thinking or give you inform useful information to improve your instruction. How do you tell if a question is good, good at causing thinking? Just find out whether the kids are thinking. What makes a good question for finding out where students are in their learning? The crucial thing is this. Kids with the right thinking and kids with the wrong thinking must give you different answers. If you're asking questions where kids with the right thinking and kids with the wrong thinking are giving you the same answer, it's a useless question. And that's why the title for this slide is that we must write questions that discriminate between correct and incorrect cognitive rules. A cognitive rule is anything a student goes through to get the right answer, to get the answer. And so there are some rules in kids' heads that are correct, there are some procedures or knowledge in their head that's correct, and there's others that are incorrect. The crucial thing about a good question is it'll tell you whether students have the right thinking or the wrong thinking in their heads. Use that as a touchstone and you'll be able to come up with very good questions. Thank you.